Hi, I'm Curtis, and I'm really pleased to be here amongst the rest of the amphibians. I haven't had the pleasure to speak in front of an audience like ourselves. Um, even though I'm a research scientist at Microsoft Research, my origins are actually I worked at the Voyager company, which had two sides of the company. One was uh, the interactive media side, where we produced interactive laser discs and CD-ROMs. And also the other side was the movie side, which is the Criterion Collection. So I spent a lot of time on both sides. I also spent a lot of time with directors and uh, actors and producers that were working on these films as we were in the process of restoring motion pictures. And through that process, I became very, very enamored of the importance of storytelling. And I want to weave that into <clears throat> this discussion that we're going to have right now. Excuse me a second. So, <clears throat> starting off with Leonardo. Um, <clears throat> Leonardo really wouldn't, I believe, think of uh, uh, science and art as two separate things. To Leonardo, I think he, he believed that science, as we see it, is really knowledge. And that knowledge comes from deep observation and experiments. And those experiments are designed to help him understand what the mental model is for how nature behaves. So if you look at this example I have on the, on the screen here, what you're looking at is an excerpt from the Codex Lester. And in that, exper in that experiment, Leonardo basically um, gives instructions on take some wood that's dry and then have a backdrop of black velvet and let smoke come up. And he said, if you look at the right amount of smoke, you'll see that the smoke is actually blue. But if you have a white background, the smoke ends up being more of an ashen color. So he was thinking, and this is about 1503, 1504, it was about the same time as he was working on the Mona Lisa and the St. Anne. And if you look at both of those paintings, certainly on the St. Anne, now that it's been restored, the sky is a beautiful blue. He also noticed that when he climbed to mountaintops that the further up he went, the bluer the sky would come, become. So in essence, there is this sort of virtual interchange between knowledge being uh, developed from experiments and then applying that knowledge in terms of creating art. And that knowledge is everything from understanding the density of smoke and the blue color shaping perspective as well as uh, size and detail and other kinds of things. I'm sure many of you have read the Walter Isaacson book about Leonardo, and that just sort of begins to go into a little bit about him, Leonardo and perspective. So Leonardo believed essentially, you know, that art and science were essentially the two branches of the same tree, and that when he looked at things, he didn't just look at it as if you, you were taking a picture. He looked at it and was analyzing what is the underlying process that's happening there. What is, there a, what is the mental model? How can I extrapolate those processes that I'm seeing in the micro level, and, and are those similar to the same processes that are happening at the higher level, at the macro level? So I had this idea, I call it contextual thinking. And the scientific method has been largely reductionist for quite a while. And my idea around contextual thinking is about how you can elevate that back up to a holistic, systemic, and relational perspective. And I call that contextual thinking. And, and when I'm designing software, um, there's sort of two aspects, as if you're building a house. Architecture is really key, and so is design. And within software, the information architecture is always where I begin to start with. And the process of how the human-computer human interaction happens is really where the design becomes very, very key as well. So I'm going to um, show you a CD-ROM that's 23 years old or something. But what's, <laughs> <laughs> what I like about it is it, it articulates and demonstrates some of these concepts of contextual thinking. So I'm going to start this here. It's a little bit old. But Fortunately, it still runs. <laughs> it was 1925. The Roaring Twenties were in full swing. A new wave of freedom was breaking over the performing arts. Jazz was hot. Modern dance, flamboyant, and free. 
Even the stodgy world of painting was in an uproar as Impressionist and Post-Impressionist works began to be shown in the United States. The opening of the Barnes Foundation astonished the art establishment. This little-known educational institute in Marion, Pennsylvania, had been quietly buying an incredible array of art. There were hundreds of works covering the walls from floor to ceiling. Masterpieces by Renoir, Cézanne, and Matisse, including the legendary Joy of Life. Even more strangely, there were tapestries, ironwork, furniture, ceramics, and African sculpture, all displayed together with the paintings. What is this place? And who is behind one of the most amazing collections of modern art in America. So in 1994-95, many CD-ROMs had um, CD-ROMs about art, but they were very much sort of reference works. You would see, you know, a picture, maybe a paragraph of information, and then you go to the next one, and they were all pretty much like a reference book. And I wanted to bring in story, and, and I wanted to bring passion uh, into a story about the artwork that's at the Barnes. Um, the other thing about the um, HCI is that in this, those other early CD-ROMs, you could go down a path and sometimes get lost and not figure out how to get back and you have to start over again. I wanted to make it really easy for people to sort of know where things were, where they were in the application. So here, you, you saw the, the beginning, which is kind of like a pre-title sequence in a movie, and it leads you in and sets up the stage for what this place is. So there are a series of guided tours. One is about Dr. Barnes and the foundation, because the first thing you might ask is, well, who is this guy and what is this place? Um, there's a tour from Joe Rischel, who's a curator of European painting at the Philadelphia Museum that talks about some of the major works in the collection. I worked closely with Jay Carter Brown, who was the director of the National Gallery of Art, and he wanted to do this tour, which is a, a common theme of works in the Barnes uh, Foundation. And then this is my favorite tour, which is a tour about the Matisse dance mural. It's about the creation of a singular work of art. I'm just going to play a little bit of it well, actually, I won't, I'll, I won't do that right now. But let me, let me just start here. We'll go into the gallery. So when I was uh, in elementary school in first grade, I saw this picture that's inside this picture, Sarat, Sunday in the Park in the Isle of La Grand Jatte. And as a first grader, we had these little posters which were about this big, which was about our height. And I always thought that's how big these paintings were until I went to the <laughs> Art Institute of Chicago. And I realized it was enormous. And um, so to me, scale and context were particularly important. So one of the things I, you can do here is I wanted to be able to place the works in the context of where they are in the Barnes Foundation. So if you wander around, you can go look at different walls and you're getting a sense of the scale of works. If I click on a work, you can hear an excerpt of that work from either of those tours. One of Cezanne's most aggressive and brutish canvases it is nudes in a landscape. Once again, there's a conscious return to classical motifs. You could go and look at the entire work, which would fill the screen, which was very unusual back then. Um, getting back to the context idea, here you can see all of the works there in chronological order. So if I wanted to see this particular work, you could, this is such a beautiful still life. If you go to the gallery, it shows you the room and wall where that painting is. So this process of exploration, you're learning about where things are, how big things are, where are they in relation to the other works in the collection itself. I also wanted to present a, a, a historical context for the works as well. So if I go here and we look at um, the paintings, uh, they're arranged by time, uh, in relation to other events. So here you could see that Stravinsky was working on the Rite of Spring. And the Wright brothers were flying when Brousseau was painting. And then there's other milestones in architecture, music, etc. So you get a deeper sense of context in terms of what's happening in the time related to the artwork that might be influences. Another important aspect I want to bring to it was that when I first got the assignment to work on the Barnes project, uh, I had read that all of the papers had been burned in a fire in the 1950s. And when I got there, they said, well, that turned out not to be true, actually. 
Um, three years ago, we discovered in, a, in the attic of a building that used to be the administration building, 31 filing cabinets filled with tens of thousands of documents. And so you and the curator at Philadelphia and the National Gallery can go and have a look. And so what I did as well is I saw a good number of these, and I wanted to bring that experience back to people here who are looking at the city. Here you can see a, all the different paintings, Renoir and Normantiers. In fact, if you want to see that painting, Normantier, we can go to the index here and sort by title, and then we'll go to in, and you can see a thumbnail, which helps you know which one that is. Again, you can see where that is in the gallery itself, which is right here. Um, the archive section also has amazing things like letters, checkbook stuff, <laughs> Barnes saved everything. But this is a remarkable one from Joseph Duran Royal, who's his dealer in Paris, and he talks about uh, visiting with Renoir and uh, talks about Pierre and Jean, who he knows a well known film director. So, this idea of story with contextual exploration, with source information, provides you a way to build a mental model through this process of uh, exploration. And in fact, I used to get fan mail, and it's kind of weird to get fan mail as a CD-ROM producer, but, you know, where people would say, you know, I've always wanted to go there. I, I went, I, I looked at the CD-ROM, and it really made me want to go, and when I went there, I felt like I had been there before, which is like exactly what I was hoping for. So that idea of con contextual exploration is there. So um, the next project I want to show you is um, it's called Leonardo da Vinci. And um, this project started because in 1980, Armin Hammer bought the Codex Lester. And he brought it to LA at the LA County Museum of Art. And I was so excited to see something by Leonardo because it was nothing by him at that time. And I remember looking at the first page, which you have, you can see a close-up right here, but there was really nothing that they had for me to help me understand what it was. It was just something very general. It was about astronomy and water and the earth, and it was always kind of frustrating to me that um, I never really got to understand what that was about. But um, 14 years later, I was working at a company um, called Continuum, and um, I had just read that Bill Gates had bought the Codex Lester, and I knew what it was. And so I sent him a two-page treatment. I said, Bill, here's what I would do if I had the Codex Lester. I would get five of the greatest scholars in the world, and we would come together and put together the history of the Codex and then build a translator so everybody can understand the Codex. Leonardo sort of loved organic metaphors for helping him understand the greater models of the processes at work. So we have this idea of a tree, and as we know, the branches of the tree, art and science, are very close together. But the tree is actually symbolic of Leonardo. So the roots of the tree are in the Renaissance, and this is a story about the Renaissance for kids that don't know much about that. But then the, the story builds in the trunk from the life of Leonardo, his thinking, and a discussion of nature, which is the Codex Lester. The Lester is about the earth, the water, and the heavens, and then above that, if you remember the exploration in the gallery, this is the interactive exploration on each of these different topics. And then we had the archives that you just saw. These are at the very top of the tree. The fruit of the tree is a result of Leonardo's work, which is a gallery of all of his paintings in one room. So you can get some context of that. And you can go in and compare the version of the rocks or the Ginevra or look at the back of the Ginevra which is at the National Gallery nearby. Um, but you could also go and take a tour and learn about the Codex Lester. In 1690, by the great power of gold, a painter named Giuseppe Ghezzi acquired a remarkable manuscript. It concerned the weight and motion of the waters and was composed, written, and illustrated by the illustrious painter and geometrician Leonardo da Vinci. An inscription identified its former owner as Guglielmo della Porta, a sculptor who had died in 1577. For more than a hundred years, it had lain unnoticed in a locked chest. The story gets a lot better, but we don't have enough time. <laughs> uh, so let's go up to see the codex. So these um, themes here tells you which pages 
the themes that are, the pages are about. So if I clicked astronomy and I went over to the first page, one recto, you can get insights about that page, you can get a synopsis about it, but let's look at the page itself. So it's written in Italian, but it's easier to read if it's not mirror script. So we can flip the page over. So now you can, can you read this? It says, l'adversari oppone, which means the adversary opposes. And what you begin to realize is that he writes in first person because he has uh, a virtual or sometimes a real adversary where he's putting together his argument and the counterpoint comes from the adversary himself. And if you actually want to learn uh, Italian, you can do this. You can go see Larvaceti and Sun and Luna. Okay. So the, you see a commonality in the information architecture between the two, between uh, those components. The last thing uh, in terms of demonstration I want to show you is uh, something called Worldwide Telescope. And um, I'm going to do something here. I'm going to switch out and start here. There we go. So. Um, Worldwide Telescope actually is something, another thing that I was very curious about, astronomy. And I really was not happy with the kinds of resources that I would see out there. I grew up with that poster of the solar system with a big sun and then they have all these planets. And of course the scale is completely wrong. And um, so all the kids of our generation grew up with, uh, you know, basically the wrong context about, about the sky and the universe. So I wanted to, to basically build uh, a virtual universe that would bring together all the imagery and all the data into one place. And, and in addition to that, I also wanted the ability to have kids and astronomers to be able to create guided tours in this virtual universe that they can share with anybody else. And so in 2005, uh, there was, I was invited to speak at this um, it was a conference called The Visualization of Astrophysical Data. And um, there were a lot of astrophysicists and other astronomers, and all I had was a PowerPoint uh, slide, a couple of slides, uh, of my vision of what I, what I wanted to convey. I wanted uh, an experience where you could see the sky, but a way to present the context of that sky. So like here, you're looking at a visible light view of the night sky. Um, we also have 85 different wavelengths of the sky from dust to, you name the wavelength. But it's also um, a seamless image. So this is a trillion pixel image. And because of that, you can seamlessly go from wide field view of the sky into very, very deep uh, detail. So like if I decided I wanted to go look into the Orion Nebula, you could just keep on going. And uh, you see this little thing that looks like a black grain of rice? So that's actually a solar system forming. You can see a glow from a star being formed in the center of that. And this is a very rich star forming region here in Orion. And a lot of that is partly because of these four very bright massive stars that is precipitating the formation of stars in that area. So that's an example of just the basic things that are here. There are also things like guided tours, like here is a guided tour uh, called Dust and Us. The Milky Way is a spiral galaxy, but it's hard to see that because we're inside it. Here's a spiral galaxy not far from us, about 12 million light years away, called M81. If we look at it in optical light, we see billions of stars shining together in a spiral pattern. If we look at the heat from M81 rather than the light, it looks like the false color orangey image we see here. This Spitzer Space Telescope image uses long wavelength cameras that can see heat, just like the one that took the picture of this cat. Galaxies are filled with tiny... So I'm going to pause here. So. What looked like video is actually not video at all, and that's the best part of it, actually, because we are actually moving around, looking at images in the sky 
But you can also go and do research behind any of these objects here. So if I wanted to go and figure out which papers have been righted, have been written that cite this particular um, galaxy, you can see there are 3,693 and there's links to the most recent ones, January of 2018. And that's just one little tiny bit of what's in here. We, you can start from the Earth and go all the way out, exit the Milky Way and see the large scale structure of the universe as well. And then I'm going to show you a guided tour of that. And that's right here. John Hucker was born in 1948, about 14 billion years after the Big Bang. It's only during the last hundred of that 14 billion years that human beings have figured out that we live in an expanding universe. When John was born, no one really knew how fast the universe was well, expanding, how old it was, or where the galaxies were in that stretching space. Lucky for us, John Huckra saw our ignorance as a fantastic opportunity. As an astronomer, his principal goal was to learn the three-dimensional distribution of matter so I can pause that. So we were actually flying through the Sloan galaxies. And just like I um, wanted to find out more about that particular galaxy before, I can do the same thing here and get access to well, I'll make it bigger here. You can see you can see the spectra, you can download the data, you can get access to more data. And then you can sort of pick up where we left off. Three-dimensional distribution of matter in the universe, much as we know and understand the surface of the Earth. But I'm going to jump ahead. Of the Earth, three numbers. And there's just what like you study carbon colleagues. Read them. It's more about many galaxies. Time for a hundred colleagues. Work the FA strip. Paint the eye. Maclusite. Where distance in a Hubble flow okay. occurs from above. So this is a seminal paper. About Here's the famous first the slice, slice from of CFA2, where velocity, the stick a proxy for distance in a Hubble flow increases so this radially is the, uh, diagram that was in that the range paper. from east to west stretching for 130 out of 360 degrees but around what you really the want sky to see is, is shown as the anagram show this which shows galaxies in, of the slice projected to make a two-dimensional view do on paper. as if we viewed the universe from an orientation 90 degrees away from our usual sky view diagram well, if we look at before we dissect its meaning the view of the universe given to us by the modern sloan digital sky survey we can see how a strip on the sky translates to a wedge in three dimensions. Well, in John's modest thing. description, map was to the on the sky. Here on the sky. Until so this the is the sky, 18,000 galaxies. From the CFA2 survey, each one of those Here we colors show represents its, galaxies um, on the sky. Color the, its distance their from us. Red and if you visualize that in 3D, you can see that the purple and blue are, of course, closer to us than the furthest, ago, fastest, most accelerating redshift galaxies. Bubbles and sheets are now obvious. What I like about this particular example of a galaxy, of a tour, is that it's kind of a virtual, um, by bringing together the data that John Huckra actually uh, collected, we brought that back into this to tell the story. It's kind of a ni very nice sort of virtuous loop. So I'm going to go back to the slides. So this was my original PowerPoint slide that I brought to that group. And um, that's John Huckra. This is the information architecture for Worldwide Telescope very much similar to the other things that you've seen, guided tours, contextual exploration to help develop, develop that internal model, as well as deep connections to data. Um, we were very fortunate that we uh, won the top prize in international design for Worldwide Telescope back in 2009. I love their quote. They said, this is not designed for the sake of design, this is designed for the sake of science, and that never happens. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty great. So, um, and then um, recently, a couple of years ago, Worldwide Telescope, uh, thanks to the effort of a lot of astronomers, including Alyssa Goodman, Worldwide Telescope has been integrated into 
uh, acquired by the American Astronomical Society and the Institute of Physics. I think they really liked what it was able to do both for science by bringing all this data and imagery together, and there are a lot of other potential uses of bringing something together. I think if you were a scientist working in a particular spectra, you wouldn't necessarily try and collect everything because it was sort of not necessarily your, your charter, but for aesthetic and educational reasons, I thought it would be great to just bring everything together, and there are other uses for it as well. This is a, a project that uh, was funded by NASA, which is the ADS All Sky Survey, and it's pretty wonderful because it takes the imagery from Worldwide Telescope, and you can um, visualize uh, each one of these dots represents a paper. In terms of where uh, publishing has happened, you can look at it by different wavelengths in terms of what objects are there. You can look at it by slices in time, uh, even institution institutions as well. So I think if you think about Worldwide Telescope and both uh, this contextual narrative that we've been talking about, I think it's an opportunity to bring some of that richness into scholarly publishing, advancing storytelling, providing durable links to data and code so other people can also reproduce that same research, providing interactive graphs, and then making things like the abstracts much more understandable to, the, to a broader audience. And so if you're interested in that idea, there's something called the paper of the future, uh, you can go look it up. There's a, a YouTube video about it. And uh, thank you for your attention.